my name my name's Donnie. I'm a customer data architect at Census. So what I do is I, I help uh, prospects and uh, and customers like use our product to to work on operational analytics. Um, and kind of the title of the talk is kind of modern data snacks. Kind of like we'll use food. We have a bunch of M and M's at the end of the talk or during if you want to go grab them. Um, and we're, like the the point of, of of this is to talk about kind of using operational analytics, walk through a couple of use cases, and how data um, can have a seat at the table uh, within a business uh, to move kind of uh, to move and just increase the leverage by building trust with the organization within the organization. Um, so, kind of quick agenda, uh, like number one is like kind of the, that recipe, which is like the hub and spoke model of the modern data stack, basically using the data warehouse as the nervous system of an, of, of an organization. Um, kind of like we'll talk through like a couple diagrams of like what that can look like. Um, num number two is kind of like building the buffet, um, kind of how uh, operational teams can self-serve data into their tools. Um, and kind of we're going to talk about kind of use cases, the sales use case, as well as the marketing use case. Uh, and then we'll kind of walk through two live demos. We'll kind of have like a half time if anyone wants to go grab, <laughs> grab a drink of water or needs to, need to walk out for a sec. Uh, and then we'll jump back in and walk through the marketing use case. Um, and then we'll talk through kind of how, how operational analytics can be used for your career in data and for uh, increasing like data visibility within the organization. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the landscape, what else is already out there in terms of, uh, in terms of solutions or current ways uh, that people are solving the problem. And then um, kind of throughout, like, feel free to interrupt me with questions if you have any, uh, but we'll have a section for it at the end as well. Let me get, go ahead and get started. Um, so what is operational analytics? Um, oper like at a high level, operational analytics is bringing that analytics that is already living in your data warehouse or in your data hub and bringing that into business tools that ops user, users are using and living in on a day-to-day -day basis. So commonly that's Salesforce and, and like the CRM use case, uh, Zendesk or Intercom and like support. Uh, and then marketing, we're going to walk through a, a LinkedIn use case, uh, but kind of Google ads, Facebook ads, uh, being able to support all the different apps. Um, that a business uses. Uh, connectivity is a super important part. And uh, Census is, syncs that data from your, from your single source of truth and in, in, in from your BI tools into your operational tools. So if you'll see kind of like this overall architecture, you have like Fivetran as like that ELT spoking in to the hub. You have Segment also handling kind of that event and just spoking in. DBT is just like a layer within your hub, um, and then census is that spoke out into your business tools. Um, and then kind of like thinking about kind of a lot of the, the different use cases and a lot of like the, there's a lot of data science and machine learning that's, that's here. Um, so like, is, like, does this still count? Is this still operational analytics? Um, kind of if we have like some complicated data pipelines, we might use like a Kafka stream or, or Snowplow for event ingest. Um, and the answer is like, yes, um, kind of we, uh, we have an interoperable API that you can trigger within whatever your data engineering ecosystem is. Uh, we have like an operator for Airflow, a task for Prefect, um, and like we can work with Dagster as well. Um, and kind of the key, the key like architecture that's the same in this case uh, is kind of having that centralized hub um, and kind of for any analytics work or any data science machine learning that you're doing, as long as that's coming into the hub, like that fits very well with, uh, with our vision um, uh, as an architecture. And you can send that into your different business and ops tools. And kind of like a great question is like, why, why is this important? Why would people want to do this? Um, and the answer is just like the current process generally either looks like these two things or it doesn't exist. So number one is like there's a spaghetti stack um, of, of many different point-to-point -point integrations. Um, on the other side, like there's just a bunch of manual CSV uploads that happen in the tools. Um, and like if you've ever come across like a, like a download upload process with like data export one, data export two, data export three, like 
probably a good signal that uh, that an operational analytics tool like Census might be might be good for you. Um, and kind of with that spaghetti stack of point to point integrations, like you have to manage that scales very fast. So if you want to add a new tool, you might need to add on like eight different integrations um, and kind of make sure that all the wiring is is hooked up correctly. And you might lose some of that visibility and observability into those different tools. So that's what that's what Census can can give um, is kind of that observability um, as well as just building that out as a robust system um, that that can that can last the the test of time. So that's kind of like that first section. Any questions in terms of operational analytics and kind of why it's needed? Cool. You can kind of talk a little bit more about like that that self serve side and kind of what like why what do business teams want to do with this analytics information and why did why does data care about that too? Um, so in terms of use cases, some common ones that we see um, is just being able to get like a this 360 degree customer record, um, being able to have a view into like who your customers are, what they're doing within the product that's often not living in like the SaaS tools that uh, a salesperson or a sales ops person is actually using. Um, you don't you don't have that same context when a salesperson is hopping on the phone um, with the customer. Like they might have to, to answer questions that we should already know. Um, another side is just consistent reporting uh, and the amount of time that like a, a report from a different tool doesn't match up with the BI tool or a, a report doesn't match up between multiple different tools. Kind of that that hub and spoke approach can fix that. Uh, by making sure you have the same information that's mirrored in, in all of your different systems. And the third use case is like a specific one, which would be like lead scoring. So kind of more thinking about product-led growth um, and how can you uh, actually leverage different information about product usage um, to identify sales leads that then you could go ahead and reach out to. So any questions on kind of like these sales use cases? Um, if not, I'm going to kind of walk, walk through a, a demo of the product. Ooh. Sorry, I'm going to find my mouse. There we go. All right, cool. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump into models. This is the census UI. Um, kind of at a, at a high level, we have kind of a, a couple of different components here. Um, this is the connections tab. So the connections tab, you'll connect your data source. Um, and then uh, kind of in terms of that connectivity pillar that we talked about, um, you want to go ahead and like a pillar is that we want to be able to support all the different business apps that you'd want to use. Um, so we can kind of scroll down and, and take a look at some of these. Um, but the one that we want the two that we want to talk about today are Salesforce uh, and LinkedIn ads. Um, some, something that's that's worth flagging here too is that there are we have the ability to um, to customize uh, like to to have we have a custom API. So if you want to build out an integration um, that you, that is not currently supported natively, um, you can still gain a lot of that observability and that alerting from Census uh, with the with the flexibility of building out your own custom API. Uh, and we have some starter code to do that as well. Um, if, it, if a system that you need data in uh, is not currently natively supported, same thing with Webhook. So we have like that custom API integration right here, and then as well as well as that Webhook. Any any questions um, about kind of like the the different apps or the connectivity pillar? Cool. Just gonna go ahead and jump into models. Um, you can see that like models are you can think of uh, as like queries, basically tables that you want to link up from the source uh, that we want to go ahead and send into the different destination systems. So in this case, like um, we can connect to a DBT project, um, kind of you get that same observability that you might get um, 
that you can get at like in terms of where that's actually being sent into. Um, really with how that works is it's just running the compiled query um, to pull that from dbt. Um, additionally, like we have the ability to connect looker looks um, kind of using looker's API um, to pull out that actual compiled query um, that then we can go ahead and use as a source as well. Um, so especially this is useful if you have any business logic that's built in LookML that you like want to be able to send somewhere. Um, you go ahead and hook that up through census as well. Kind of for for the use case that I want to talk to you today is um, just like using this contact table. So um, it's this 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 kind of big company that I called Jaffle Gaggle, um, and it was like a DBT project that I worked on. Uh, but basically, you can think about it like a um, kind of like a, a B2B place um, where we have like users and customers that uh, place orders, uh, and then we want to go ahead and send that data into Salesforce. So you'll see, like, we just have a couple of users. We have um, user ID. We have like their corporate email as well as like username. A couple of just data points that you might that might be typical of what might come from your product database that's in your in your data warehouse um, that Salesforce otherwise would have no record of. So in that case, I want to go ahead and set up a sync. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and add a sync. Um, I'm going to go ahead and connect this to the Salesforce. Um, this is the sync. This is really the, the heart, the meat of what Census does. Um, so the way like we, we pull from the source, we can connect to a model. Uh, we can also connect to like just a, a, like a warehouse table or view. Um, but in this case, I want to go ahead and connect to that context. Um, and then you want to select the object uh, that you want to sync to. Um, so when we think about kind of the different connectors that we build, the different integrations that we have, um, we really think about kind of the, the depth of the use case um, and being able to support the different customers that are using the different integrations that we have. So for Salesforce, we support um, kind of every, every single, every object in terms of custom objects and standard objects, as well as the ability to like sync to multi-destination objects. So leader account um, or leader contact, depending on the different flow that you might have in, you know, on the Salesforce side. Um, kind of if, kind of our documentation um, kind of will show what objects we support for the different integrations that we have, as well as like which behaviors that we have. Um, so I want to sync to the contact object. Sorry, it's really dark. I can't really see. Cool. Um, so I want to sync to, in this case, just to the contact object. Um, and then we have to, to define kind of how we want to, to this, this sync to behave. So in this case, like, do I want to, if, if this contact already exists, I want to update it. If it doesn't, I want to create it. Um, so I'm going to do it like that. Basically, we have to define kind of how we want the data from your table or from your data warehouse to be joined to that object in the destination. And for this case, I'm just going to use an external ID. Um, but oftentimes, you see that being a user email um, or like an external ID that would come from your, uh, your product database. Um, and then um, first off, any questions here in terms of like the sync behavior? Yeah. Basically, we have certain protocol, um, certain endpoints, 
valid null in that case because that user had picked the order. So it didn't have any order data for them. So that's fine. You can send over. You need to send that one too. But in terms of the unique identifier model, you find that. And then if a destination API rejects a record because of the data value, you'll surface that as a rejected record. Does that make sense? So if it can't store a null, it can just store a null number? If it fails the invalidation of that data value, then yes, it will. It will not send that message to a null. But yeah. So that's that mapping step in terms of mapping column. Then we have the ability to choose any of the different fields that we want to go ahead and sync over, including lookup fields. So if you wanted to look up from a contact to the account that that should be tied to on the Salesforce side, which is a super common use case for a lot of different services, that's something that we want to be able to support. But in this case, I already have the field set, like the names match for what I want to send over. So I just want to go ahead and choose these. You'll see that, Samir, to talk a little bit more about your point in terms of that data validation check, you can see that we have these little icons here in terms of making sure that we're sending the correct data type from your source to the correct data type in your destination. So that's another layer that we have here. And something that we also enable here is to be the ability to run a test. So running a test would run a sync, but it would only send one record over to the destination. So yeah, so that would be like if you wanted to, if like, great, like I've, for certain services that might not have a sandbox or development environment, you might not want to kick off a full sync, but you'd want to just send over one record and see how that actually looks in the destination. And then you could just make sure that that looks good. And then cool, spot check, and go ahead. Yes, exactly. Any question on the field mapping or any of the behaviors for the syncs? Kind of one thing that I'm going to flag here too that we're not going to talk about specifically today, but this is like the entity sync, kind of syncing to a noun, like a noun as in a contact in Salesforce. There's another concept, which is like events. So like Facebook conversion events or a mixed panel event that we also have the ability to sync to. So those would be like we would append that to the destination that we also see a use case for in terms of whether it's like events that you would capture through Snowplow and you have funneling in your data warehouse or events that you would get from a transactional database and then translate towards a synthetic event. So if you have like an order creation date that you would have in your transactional database, but you don't have like your event hooked up, you can just call that event like order created and then send that over as an event to the different systems that you'd want to. That's a use case that I've been seeing a lot more lately as well. Cool. I'm just going to go ahead and kick off the sync. Kind of, uh, this is like, we're, this is going to populate this, this dashboard of just like contacts here um, with kind of like the relevant information. Um, and like, this is super, can be super relevant within organizations, especially when the ops users uh, are like finding that things aren't matching up within their systems to like the, um, to like ups, like the, analytics or the dashboards that like, they might be pulling from. Um, so being able to have kind of like the sync creation be fairly streamlined and fairly straightforward um, for these ops users to be able to self-serve information. Um, but like with kind of the quality check of it being a DBT model or it being like a, a data team approved model, um, that's kind of where, where we see like that gourmet buffet idea of the data team adding those quality checks uh, before that actually can go down into the downstream system. Um, 
we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, just want to talk a little bit about kind of some of these configuration here. Um, so we have the ability to just set this up on a schedule. Um, you can go ahead and set this up on weekly, daily, hourly, up to every 15 minutes, uh, or continuous. Um, continuous is like kind of micro batches. We would scan the warehouse every one to two minutes, and any changes that are detected will be go ahead. We'll we'll go ahead and send that over. Um, and yeah, that's how that works. And the way that we're able to do that um, is we will have a state tracking schema within our, within our customer's warehouse. Um, and that, that way, kind of, we store the snapshots of the maps columns of the data. Um, so we can do the diffing logic within a warehouse um, and like we don't store any of your data at rest. Yeah, totally. So we, we do, it's the, the data warehouse will do like a select to step to pick up the change rows on the data warehouse side. And then we'll just go ahead and send those over. So we don't need a, a column or a timestamp for last updated app. We just need the, the values that we'll actually compare. Um, and kind of data warehouses like can handle these for very high volumes of data very fast. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Um, we also have the ability to like kick off a sync via DBT Cloud, um, or uh, like kind of that interoperability piece that I was talking about earlier. You can go ahead and use kind of an API trigger, just sending a post to this endpoint. We'll go ahead and kick off a sync, um, and you can have that live within whatever ecosystem or orchestration layer that you have. Um, looks like the sync probably has gone ahead and finished, but before that, you had like an activity log on the sync in terms of like, great, I just created this. Um, and then you have the ability to configure alerts. So if a sync fails, um, all the way up to uh, different thresholds for when, for how successful a sync is, um, to actually kick off uh, an alert that you would get through Slack, uh, through email um, or, or Slack or PagerDuty or wherever you'd like to get notified if something fails. Um, great, so it looks like the sync is finished up. Kind of, uh, this is that invalidation check. So if any, if any records are, uh, like have duplicates in, in that mapping column, that they will like be flagged and not sent over. Um, and then kind of any rejected records, like this one, um, like this one has a, a comma in the, in the email address. Um, and so this gets rejected by Salesforce, and we're able to reject that at the record level as opposed to like the batch level. So the rest of the batch succeeded, um, but this one had, this, this failed, and this is for uh, debugging purposes. Yeah. would have to be corrected in the data warehouse today. Um, something that we're excited about doing as well is kind of with that right access that we have to that schema for that state tracking, um, we're, going, we're like in the, in the process of enabling, like writing back these rejected records into your warehouse. So you can have the record there, and then if you wanted to surface that and be like, okay, cool, like this is the ID of the record in that table that I would need to adjust that you can kind of like add that to a workflow as well. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Cool. Any more questions on the, the sync history piece? Okay. Cool, uh, let's go ahead, refresh this. Great, so we have, uh, so like these are like those nulls, right? Like the, the people that didn't, haven't actually placed orders, like those would come in here as just dashes. Um, and, and the reason why this is um, why this is so important for like a salesperson to get their data within a tool like this 
um, is so that they can kind of slice and dice it and do whatever they want to do with their sales, sales workflow um, within a tool that they can actually take action on. So like if I wanted to just go ahead and like just group by like that's grouping by the most recent events. Is that that helpful? Um, but yeah, like this is like the specific days that these contacts were actually active or these users. Um, and then like I can click into here this record, see like some of that information. And then like as for a salesperson, I can go ahead and actually take action. If I want to log events or add follow up tasks, I can do that. Um, as well as kind of configure workflows in these tools um, that sales ops people um, are often thinking about um, and that, that actually like they basically live in these tools um, from from that perspective uh, and kind of the data team and the ops team like this can bridge this gap um, such that like if a new field is needed to be added here um, you go ahead into configuration and then you can just go ahead and quickly add a field uh, versus needing to edit an existing pipeline um, to go ahead and add that on. So it's fairly straightforward in terms of a salesperson that might want to jump in and add, add, add data that would be coming. Cool. Um, any, any questions about the kind of the sales use case? That we, that we can kind of answer now. Um, that was kind of like the sales piece to the demo. Um, so kind of like just wanted to call like quick halftime. If anyone wants to go grab water or something, feel free. If you want to grab M&Ms, happy to answer any questions. We, we're going to be talking a little bit um, more and more in depth about like the sales use case uh, next week. Uh, I'll. I'll be leading that um, as a webinar, which will be super fun. Um, and then we also have uh, the ability to like, kind of take yourself to swag. Uh, if you want, you just go in um, and then you like edit, uh, and you'll use kind of that custom API for uh, for us to, to send you a, a SQL t-shirt. Maybe at the conference.
Um, All right, we're going to go ahead and, and kind of get get started with the marketing use case. Um, th thanks, thanks for the, the halftime. It was nice to chat and hang out. Um, kind of like, I want to talk about kind of like what, we talked about like what sales with, does with operational analytics. Now I want to talk folks a little bit more on like what marketing does with operational analytics. Um, and uh, a, a big piece is around kind of segmenting in audiences uh, and kind of like customer lists. So if you think about like use cases, you might want to e exclude your current customers from like spending to get them to click on ads or to show them ads. Um, you might want to like you leverage lookalike audiences to uh, like allow like Facebook or Google or Snapchat to try to find users that look like those users um, that you already have. Um, you might want to, like, you might have, like, an, a renewal coming up for a customer, and you want to, like, have, like, hyper-targeted hyper -targeted marketing campaigns at, like, renewals or potential upsells for your existing customers. Um, or, like, you might want to use those conversion events that we were talking about, like, actually placing an order, completing your onboarding flow, um, kind of deeper in the funnel moments that you can go ahead and kind of set up an offline conversion event. Um, we're going to go, in like a couple of weeks, we have like a, a little bit more in-depth, another webinar about like kind of operational analytics for marketing. Um, but I'm excited to kind of walk you through using that same customer list uh, and then syncing that into uh, LinkedIn um, to, for the potential for, for showing ads. So, let me see where my mouse is. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and go back to that Jaffa Dial contacts. Um, so, you, you'll notice we have this status here. Um, and what this status means is, like, it's basically the data team being able to stamp approval um, of a model or of, a, of like, a, a SQL query uh, or a model that might come from DBT. Um, and that exposes the ability to create a segment. Um, and what a segment is, uh, is basically just the ability to kind of ha use a no-code builder um, on top of like an, an already existing uh, data model um, that's already living in your data warehouse. So uh, a, key, a, a, a time we see, we see this often with uh, like marketing users that want the ability to just create audiences and audience lists um, that they might not know SQL. Um, but if they have like the the list of customers with all of the different metrics that you might want to have, um, they could go work off of that to create their different audiences and sync those into different business tools. Um, so like I have like number of events greater than twenty five. We can, can support a number of different data types. Uh, and like we have like the less than one hundred twenty days ago. Um, if like you want a boolean, like that that also can handle. Uh, you can functionally think about this like a where clause at the end of a SQL query. Um, but any questions here on kind of segments? Yeah.
all of the data types that we use that are different, like for Redshift, it's like a super type, or like your site date times and timestamps and all the different types depending on the different courses. Um, so that's part of like when we add that on, uh, add on the in an integration source, something that we look for to make sure that we have proper mappings to make sure that we never lose any data. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and set up a sync. So you can see that like uh, another important part of this in terms of like these segments and in terms of like operational analytics being the same spoke is that you can reuse that definition in across a number of different channels. Um, so I already have this being synced into Google Ads. I'm going to configure it for LinkedIn ads. So I have this just as my new data source. I'm going to go ahead and select LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to go ahead and select this is a user list because these are my users. Um, and then we, have, we need to choose like that identifier again. Um, in this case, like I have that email. So I'm going to go ahead and, and use that email. Um, for many of the marketing use cases, they like only accept SHA, SHA 256 hash um, data. Um, so you can either send, give census your unhashed data, and census will hash it for you in flight, or you can also have it pre-hashed, um, and then we just won't touch it. We'll send it as is. Um, and then you have like different like identifiers. Like we support different identifiers for every different object. But in this case, so I just want just the email, it's like that email. And then um, we have the ability here to be able to add that to an existing existing user list that comes from LinkedIn um, or the ability to create one. Um, so like I can just go ahead and create like engaged users. Um, uh, I would do like spreadsheet M&M. &M. Uh, and that will go ahead and create that as, uh, as an audience in LinkedIn. Um, and I just go ahead and pull that up. So this looks like this. Uh, like, basically what you can do in LinkedIn is you can have this be a user list, and then on top of that, you can configure your different audience logic that you'd want for the different ad campaigns. But let's go jump back here. Great. So I have that. Um, I want to just go ahead and add like first name, last name. Um, the way that these marketing, these advertising tools work is that um, you'll pass it like a unique identifier and then as much personal inf information as you have. Um, and then these tools will match based on like their own internal data sets to be able to identify, like to, re to like handle the resolution between what you know about a customer and what these tools know um, so that they can target those people. Um, so that's why you hear about like match rates and whatnot in these advertising use cases. Um, you can go ahead and send a test, but I'm just going to go ahead and kick off the sync um, for this, this segment here. Um, and I'll go ahead and create it. One thing, um, that, one thing that's, that, that we often see is like when we have like a sliding window, like this filter that I have um, from this segment, is that we'll have the, you can configure a mirror sync. And what a mirror sync does is like if a, if a user no longer meets the criteria for that for that segment, um, a sync will go ahead and delete that from that audience in the destination. Um, so that like if you have like a four month window and someone had ordered like three months and twenty nine days ago, and like they're in the list, and then like it syncs again in like four days, like that user would then be deleted from that list because it no longer meets that criteria. Um, really common case that we see with a lot of these advertising destinations. Cool. Um, we have like, yeah, just kind of the alerting. I mean, any questions in terms of kind of like this, this advertising use case? This is one that like, remember that if we like go back to that, that slide, this is often one um, that this is the case for either a marketing ops person or the marketing team themselves. A lot of CSV downloads and a lot of CSV uploads um, that census can just help automate. 
um, and kind of add that dip, that quality control. Um, and the like you can, it's a very straightforward for data to get an easy win with the marketing team um, to like have this run on a schedule, have this be automated, use your first party data that you already have. So, um, no, you can you can have it like be targeted towards. My understanding is that you can only show ads to specific audiences. Like, if you wanted to do like account based marketing, my understanding is that you can do that based on like certain accounts that you might want to advertise to, or like or like that audience plus like lookalike of that audience, um, but uh, like that's that's my best understanding. I don't know if they should, if you know. Yeah, I'm not, that would be, that would be big. Big. Yeah. So you could sync like eight individuals and say, okay, you're sending this out to eight individuals. I mean, they can take the, all the advertising platforms and buy you and get you on there for AD app or for uh, Mm -hmm. But the way that this uh, managed by you is run a hot sauce campaign. So you would take effectively the, the list of, of platform data, and then you could do, you know, essentially, like you said, uh, very targeted marketing to that group, like directly to retargeting. And you could do uh, look like as a, as a choice. But the way that I would do it is this messy CSV to the right. And by the way, this Mm -hmm. uh, that's <laughs> How many that's the customer list that you want? Exactly. <laughs> the most recent. That real. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciated that. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, let's go ahead and. And, uh, well, first off, I want to just go ahead and. Uh, partner, there's, there's another piece here, um, which is that, like, these audiences take time to build. So like that match process, like you can like the, this, odd, this this customer list it's created, but LinkedIn has its own matching algorithm that it'll it, it has to run to to go ahead and do that. So you'll see like I uploaded those audiences two days ago, um, but now they're ready, um, and then like it'll, it'll give you a rough estimate of how many people fit that audience. Um, in Facebook, it'll give you a match. In in Google, it'll give you a match rate. Um, I think Facebook will also give you a match rate as well. Um, to, in terms of who they're able to identify. Um, great, and then like, kind of like, to touch on that point as, as well, like these, these audiences, these entities, like in terms of this logic, you wanna be able to have that synced into all of your different tools. Um, so not only just LinkedIn, but maybe Google or Facebook or Snapchat, TikTok or Bing, like, um, they, and this is specifically important because you will always have access to your user data, like with like whatever the user data that you put in, um, like that you might need to sign up to an account, you might need an email, you might get some of that personal information anyway. Um, and kind of like with like kind of some of the, the cookie tracking and, the, and that browser tracking, um, like you have the, like you always still have that data in your warehouse. Um, that like you're able to like let make that customer data work for you in this way. Any questions here in terms of this this marketing use case? Um, if not, kind of want to I want to share. Let's see if this works. The audio here, fingers crossed. 
in that. When my coworkers always said that I'm a data angel, because I previously thought I was, you know, elf on the shelf, like the little elf in Santa's factory delivering the data. But I'm actually like, he rebranded it. He's like, you know, you're a data angel. I'm like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Such a good reminder that so many people in a company, it's like you're bringing them something they don't they don't have. So it's like yeah. it feels like magic from the heavens. Oh. Exactly. She brought us the data, <laughs> and then eventually they'll get used to it, and then they'll just complain when the data is broken. But exactly, at first it really does feel like this gift. Yeah. Um, so that this was from uh, a recent podcast, uh, the Sequel Show that that Census puts on with, with our CEO Boris. Um, and this is this is Jessica Cherney. She's the like, she she does data analytics at Ironclad, which is a customer of Census. Um, she also leads uh, a, a great commu a Slack community um, of like women in data called Data Angels. Uh, so shout out to her. Um, but uh, I, I do want to talk about like that in terms of like being like the data the data elf on the shelf and kind of this concept of like being able to bring like this data to ops users and how like how important and like how much of a of a gap there is that can be bridged by this concept of operational analytics. Um, and this like, the oh, she's the come on, there it is. Like, um, like operational analytics is this bridge that like, that lines up those two, that, that gap between like the data and the actual data practice, like the users of the data uh, within an organization, finance organization, customer success, logistics, all of these different components that work within a business, um, they need to consume data, and there are processes that can be optimized by using the right kind of analytics. Um, additionally, like that 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 request and like that complaining when the data is broken, um, like that data, the fact that data team has to respond a lot to operational requests, if the ops users are able to self serve that data um, from a trusted source. Like if like all of those those Salesforce dashboards, all of that marketing data has the stamp of approval for what is the definition of a customer um, and what is like the definition of product usage, like there are less quality issues that might happen, less data mismatching, um, and like you can kind of you can approach self serve in a way that will give the data at the fingertips and the tools that ops people need. To um, and additionally, like with that observability functionality, with like the data typing, not sending over duplicates, with being able to alert when things fail, um, and being able to like be resilient with dealing with the post APIs for these systems that are super unreliable, um, it's building agile, like adaptable, resilient systems for the long term. Um, that like you need, you don't need to build out an integration for each different tool, you can let census handle the, the observability, the alerting, and kind of the headache of integrating with your different systems. Um, and that will enable you, uh, as a data person, to focus more on, uh, to move from just kind of measuring like simple KPIs, like what is our customer acquisition cost? Kind of what's our channel-based NRR? What are our sales numbers? Um, to be able to, to like move them, to use, operational analytics to build trust within an organization to be like at the table um, talking about how do we lower our customer acquisition costs? How should we think about our data definition? How do we want to increase our revenue and our revenue retention rate? Like, what are some strategies that actually put this into practice? And how can we operationalize the insights that we have? Um, so often data is like not left, is not brought to that discussion when there's a ton of truth and information that the data team can add within the organization in this context. Uh, and operational analytics is a way to build that trust with those stakeholders. Any questions about this? Cool. Um, great, so uh, kind of why is operational analytics different? Um, and I, I, I'd say that there are three main uh, like three main components to what, like in terms of existing solutions that are out there. Like one is kind of a custom integration 
that might be like sometimes I hear it described as like Python code wrapped in duct tape uh, in terms of just integrating different systems. You might have that um, like maybe using a, a like different different frameworks uh, or SDKs of services, um, but uh, there's a lot of maintenance cost to open source system or open source or home built systems. Um, you need to build it, you need to maintain it. When something breaks, you gotta like hop in and like solve why. Um, you also like need to build out alerting or resiliency. Um, at least for many of the systems that I built. Um, I did not build out proper alerting systems <laughs> or resiliency. Um, so I spent a lot, of, a lot of time when something failed, like reworking what, why it failed, playing a lot of time spending data, like spent a lot of time playing data detective in that way. Um, and then like you just need to deploy a new integration. You need to build a new integration for every new tool that you want to add. Another one is like customer data platforms. Um, so why, why is that different? Like, what what is what are like pieces here is like that once you turn on a stream that comes from a CDP, like it's on. Um, like you turn on and like the hose starts going. Um, and these are event based systems. So like one, like they happen at like a one, uh, one of one event like a click page view. Um, what are they really good at? They're really good at like event capture and identity stitching. Um, but they're not, they, they weren't designed to handle uh, or give observability into uploads into tools, imports into different, different data systems. Um, and like oftentimes, like costs will scale as data volumes scale. So as your customer base is growing, like <laughs> the cost for CDP often grows proportional to the, to the growth rate of your customers, um, almost penalizing you for, for like being successful. Um, and then kind of like IPaaS or kind of point to point, similar like event based uh, general model. Um, you don't have as much observability into when they fail. Uh, they can, they tend to fail silently. Um, and you don't have like that kind of holistic observability features um, or kind of like reliability when things fail. And kind of how is, how is OA different? Like, Operational analytics pulls like the most recent data from the definitions of the hub. You don't have to like fix bespoke integrations at each different point to point. New integrations can be configured and synced in minutes. We just walked through two use cases, Salesforce and LinkedIn. We did that probably all in 10 minutes tops. Um, so you can you see like as long as you have the data living in your data warehouse, you can go ahead and, and get that set up right away. Um, another, another piece is that costs are predictable. They don't penalize your business for growing. Um, the census cost model is based on destination fields. So what are the, the columns in a table that you are syncing over to the different destination objects? Doesn't depend at all on data volumes. And it doesn't depend, uh, there are no hidden fees regarding that. Um, and then like that observability, alerting, scalability, that's all built in uh, within the architecture such that like you don't have to worry about if things fail, like census can just take care of that for you. Um, great, like thanks for joining. Um, a quick shout out to uh, the, our operational analytics Slack community that we have um, that Parker uh, is, is, is a member of and, and is leading. Um, and like, feel free to sign up for a free trial um, and feel free to ask me any questions. It was great chatting with you today. Uh, really appreciate it.